Jim Jacobs, Hall of Fame handball champion, dominated the sport for close to a generation, providing a mixture of masterful offense and innovative defense unparalleled in the game's history. Possessed with a devastating array of kill shots, serves, and pass shots, Jim brought handball into the modern era with the perfection of the ceiling game and his strategic choice of shots. His talent, combined with a competitive and compassionate spirit, earned him the respect and admiration of his peers and fans across the country. As Jim did in all his endeavors, he personified a quality of character and professionalism that was cherished by all who knew him or saw him play ball. In this rare and priceless collection of films, you will have the chance to meet Jim Jacobs as a 13-year-old neophyte, as seen here, who went on to become a champion of champions, both on and off the court. Welcome to the world of handball and the legend of Jim Jacobs. Hi, this is Art Linkletter. I'm here with handball great Stuffy Singer to bring you a glimpse of Jim Jacobs on the court, share his philosophy and lore. Especially after his very fine games the day before, by beating the clever Harry Dreyfus, the Art, what are we watching now? The upset of the tourney thus far was the We'll be watching footage of Jim Jacobs leading up to his first United States Handball Association National Championship, won in 1955. Jim had trained and played on his home court, the Los Angeles Athletic Club. He was beginning to develop his skills on his way to becoming a real force in the handball world. Let's take a look at the semifinals of the 1954 Nationals against defending champion Bob Brady. I remember the first time I met Jim Jacobs, it was at the Hollywood YMCA. I'd been a four-wall handball nut for about 25 years, playing in San Diego, San Francisco, and then in Hollywood, and this young kid came along and he was taking up the game, and all of us old-timers were astounded. Within a couple of months, he was playing as well as we were. I never saw anybody learn the game so fast. And I had the pleasure of watching him grow to be a great champion. The loss of the powerhouse, Kenny Schneider, Gus Lewis, and Walter Plekin from the single field, made it a clear-cut finals of Brady and Hershkowitz all the way, with a possible upset of Brady by Jacobs, which was not to be. Not this year. But look out for this kid in the tournaments to come. It was a tough semifinal loss for Jim, but it only made him more determined for the next year. And here is a look at that next year. A one-game exhibition match in early 1955 against defending four-wall champion the great Vic Herskowitz. Here we see an exhibition match between Jimmy Jacobs of the local club and national champion Vic Herskowitz. These shots were made during a visit by the USHA representatives while on tour of the leading handball centers. Vic was beaten by Jacobs rather easily in a one-game match by a score of 21 to 10. These shots are made on 16 millimeter film and shot at 32 frames per second rather than the conventional sound shooting speed of 24 frames per second. The slower motion of the action permits a better idea of the game and slows the action of the ball down for a closer study by the audience. A study of these and similar pictures by local television producers assure us of complete TV coverage during the coming Nationals. Check this lineup of champs. The boys are here warming up toward the glass to give the viewers a better chance to make their acquaintance. It's doubles champ Sam Haber, national singles champ Gus Lewis, and the present national champ Vic Hershkowitz, teamed with a third ranking player, Jimmy Jacobs. What a match this turned out to be. The action was so fast, it took a slow motion camera to record. Haber and Lewis won it in two games, and here is why. Watch this kill off the back wall by Haber. Vic serves to Sam now, and watch how Haber takes this one off the side wall. Think 
Caber can't miss? Well, watch this same shot with Sam missing his left corner kill. That's how it will look in 1955. What a match. Four all-time greats. And the only non-national champion in that picture is Jimmy. It's the 1955 Nationals in L.A. Jim was pressured to get past a tough Phil Collins, pictured here, only to meet former champion Gus Lewis on his way to the finals. Jim's first national championship was within grasp. The popular ex-champion from Chicago, Gus Lewis, is meeting with Jacobs. Jim won a close decision in two games. The 47 champion is still one of the toughest singles players in the game. In the starring role, Vic Hershkowitz, the master of the wall, with 16 national titles under his belt. And playing the heavy role was our own club champion, Jimmy Jacobs. This part of the story was televised throughout Southern California by the popular Hollywood star and handball player, Art Linkletter. He was assisted by the fine sports announcer, Bill Welch. The powerful and speedy Jacob seems a little nervous in his first big part. The veteran Hershkowitz has been cast in these hero roles so often it's old stuff to him. Both men had some tough games getting to the finals. Vic was pressed to three games by a young Johnny Sloan, and Jimmy Jacobs had three long games with Phil Collins. Gus Lewis also gave Jimmy trouble, with 21-20 and 21-19 scores. But here they are, so on with the game. Jimmy won the toss and will serve to Vic, who has the number one on his shirt. Jimmy wears the number two. Jimmy draws first blood with a corner kill shot. Now Jimmy misses a right corner kill for an out. A perfect ace down the right wall. Now it's Vic's turn to miss, side out. This time Vic makes a perfect kill. The boys settle down to steady play now, but Vic finds an opening and kills in the right corner. Vic seems to like that corner kill and tries another one for a point. Three playing one. Jacob seems a little tight, and the pace is picking up. Jim misses to make it four to one. Notice how the champ likes to keep in the front court. He is trying for the right corner kill, and gets it. Five playing one. Another ace for Vic. Six plays one. Here comes another one. Ace. Seven to one. Jacob's strategy to use high ceiling shots and lobs to the backcourt corners seems to be paying off. It looks like the champ is feeling the running. Vic now makes the score 18 to 14 with a right hand kill shot. Again, we see how Jimmy is determined to keep Vic moving and prevent those serve and kill rallies. Even though Vic has to work harder for his shots, he still keeps working for the kill and finally lays one away. Vic now serves with 19 points to Jimmy's 14. Two points away from the first game of the national championship. The points are not coming easy at this stage of the game. 
and Jimmy is bouncing around the court like a rubber ball. He seems to get his hand on everything Vic can throw. But a left corner kill is the shot Vic uses to end the rally for the 20th point. As Vic serves for his 21st point, everyone but Jimmy thinks the game is about over. But Jim comes up with his famous right corner kill and puts Vic out. Here comes one of the ceiling shots that Vic misses to keep Jimmy in the running. Here comes another error which Vic made to bring Jimmy up to 16 plays 20. Here's another one of the long rallies of the two game finals. 40 seconds of lightning like action by both players. It is interesting to note that this is the first time any finals were photographed on movie film showing the entire action of both games. In running and rerunning of these films, the student of handball is able to analyze every motion made by the two players and decide the factors which accounted for victory or defeat. The splendid effort put forth for the champion in digging the kill shots of Jimmy shows the fighting heart of Vic and explains why he holds so many titles. It is apparent to the champ now that this kid Jacobs is built of steel bands. He just won't give an inch and never seems to tire. Notice the beautiful control of the ball Jimmy keeps from the serve on in this rally. Everything's down the left till Vic brings one out and then it's a hard drive down the right wall for a pass shot. The score now, 19 playing 20. This time, Jimmy fails to keep Vic deep, and the champ picks one out of the air off the right wall for a perfect kill shot. Side out, 20 to 19. Vic seems to give Jimmy rather an easy serve to start this long 44 second rally, and never quite gets the offense away from the challenger. Jimmy finally gets a good right hand crack at the ball and whips it down the left wall with a good hop which makes it jump into the left wall and break into Vic's body for a side out. Here Jim tries for the quick way to score, but gets a short ball. 19 playing 20. Jimmy now gives Vic an easy serve, which Vic tees off on and gets Jim in a hole. Then passes Jimmy down the left wall for the out. This is the third time Vic will serve for the game point, And again, he's short. Now on the fourth try for the game point, Vic serves with his left hand, trying to change his luck, no doubt. The serve was a tough toss around the walls, but Jim brought it back well, and the 52-second rally is on. Both men hit the ball a total of 21 times in this battle, and the try for kills was almost nil. Both seem content to make the other man miss. And it was Vic that came up with the air on a high shot to the right rear corner that looked like it may have crotched and took a bad bounce. Jimmy is holding on to the front court and won't be moved out. Vic tries to drive one of Jimmy, but Jimmy drops it down on the right side for a kill and the tying point. The score now, 20 plays 20. Here Jimmy hurries to retrieve the ball and get his serve off as he feels Vic is tiring. He wants that 21st point badly, but Vic calls dead ball as he's not ready. Here comes the game-winning play. 
Jim keeps Vic in the rear court, and Vic dumps a high shot into the floor, giving Jimmy the game point. The score, 21 to 20. A predominantly local gallery gives Jimmy a tremendous hand for his stunning first game victory. This well-muscled youngster of 24 has proven the advanced publicity to be right. He is capable of winning the title in Jim 1955. Jim brought the ceiling shot into the game, in the using it both game, as a defensive and an offensive weapon. Vic's strength as a one and three wall player were his offensive tools. Jim's strategy was to employ his own defensive skills to counteract Vic's aggressive play. Ultimately, this approach was the deciding factor in the match. Jimmy started off moving well and full of confidence. His placements and perfect kill shots had Vic missing repeatedly. 11 errors for points was the champion's record for the last game. In the first game, Vic gave away nine points on errors. That's a total of 20 points in two games. The powerhouse Jacobs made only six errors in both games. That is how the record book told the scoring, and you are seeing the very misses in the first few rallies of the second game. In this final game, the youngster Jacobs scores at will. Vic seems tired and uninterested in the battle. Jimmy is displaying a well-balanced, all-around type of handball. He has two fine hands, a deadly kill shot, wonderful placements, the power to pass his opponent almost at will. And above all, as demonstrated in the first game, he has the ability to pace himself. Unlimited strength, speed and stamina, and a rare coolness under pressure. After working on these films for some time and having the chance to view this kid in action many, many times, I finally found the above description of the boy in the Ace Yearbook and written by the man that should know, Angie Trulio. Trulio also observes that Phil Collins and young Sloan could give Jimmy a good game with an additional 20 pounds weight on their frames. This remark seems to be the secret. Jimmy has the power to drive the pass shots down the walls with apparently no effort. He can drop low and whip a kill shot in as fast as the best of them. He seems to change his mind in the middle of an attempt and nonchalantly lob an easy one up to the ceiling and drop it in to the rear corner. He can catch up to the pass shots and hit the rear wall to the front wall with either hand. And if you have never had to face his serves, you're lucky. It will hop a foot or more either way, and the ball is traveling like a bullet. Vic misses the kill laid down by Jimmy for the final point and the match. A new champion is made. The crowd was overwhelmed with the startling victory the 24-year-old kid had given the master of the handball world. Jimmy lost 15 pounds in the week-long play, and Vic must have lost at least 10. It was a tough road to hoe with men like Lewis, Schrupp, Sloan, Collins, and Paul Stoby. All had to be played, and in one week, with very little rest, these two boys reached the top of the 64 bracket tournament. The intensity and dedication so familiar in Jim's career did not happen by chance. He said he devoted five years of his life to winning this first national singles title. And the legend begins. And Jacobs at 24. How about next year? Can Vic get in the kind of shape it's going to take to win the crown back again? And he did get in great shape but not enough to withstand the devastating attack of the new champion when they met in 1956 in St. Louis or in 1957 in Dallas. Here in the first game of this 1957 AAU finals against Bob Brady, Jim is having a tough time adapting to the 46-foot-long court of the Olympic Club in San Francisco. The players certainly needed this well-deserved timeout, considering the non-stop action. Brady was relentless and one of the most feared competitors in the game. His aggressive play and consistent attack was his formula for success. That's right, Art. But Jim had just won his third straight USHA Nationals, and playing in his AAU Finals, Jim was not going to lose his number one ranking in the handball world without a war. And a war it was. Here's Brady at his two-handed best, moving Jim around the court, and ending the first game with a sensational right-corner kill. 
Stuffy, Bob's hometown fans went wild as Brady wins the first game and is one game away from winning the AAU championship. The second game, however, was all Jacobs. Jimmy overwhelmed Brady with a massive display of firepower to even the match. Now it's a one-game match for the title. Here in the third game, Jimmy picked up where he left off, rushing out to a commanding 18-12 lead. But Brady refused to yield, fighting back point by point to even the match at 18-all. While holding Jimmy scoreless, Brady called on all of his years of experience, his tenacity and aggressive play to do the impossible. He miraculously fought back from 18 to 12 to a 21-18 win. Of interest to our audience is this is only one of two losses that Jimmy suffered during his 12-year domination of this game from 1955 through 1967. Here in 1959 at Detroit's Palmer Park, Jim meets Oscar Obert in the finals of the Three Wall Nationals. You know, Art, Oscar Obert, known as the Bronx Bomber, brought to Three Wall Handball the same two-handed attack that gained him prominence as a great one-wall champion. In defeating Vic Hershkowitz in the semifinals 21-20 in the third game, Oscar actually broke Vic's nine-year reign as Three Wall Handball King. In the finals, Oscar was at his fly-shooting best but it was the overall court generalship of Jacobs that spelled the difference and brought Jim his first national three-wall title. Stuffy pictured here is an incredible array of handball firepower that competed for the doubles crown. Oscar and Ruby Obert of one-wall fame against the monster team of Jim Jacobs and Vic Herskowitz. The Oberts had established themselves as great all-around handball players who were famous for their powerful drives and two-handed kills from every spot on the court. Using these skills, they found the three-wall court much to their liking. In three hotly contested games, it was the devastating kills and passes of the Obert brothers that overcame the talents of the legendary duo of Jacobs and Hershkowitz. An interesting side note was that the Jacobs-Hershkowitz tandem were never able to win a national championship together. Following year, Jacobs returned to Detroit to defend his three-wall title and in the quarterfinals defeated John Scopus of Detroit before overcoming Ruby Obert of New York in the semifinals. In the bottom half of the bracket, Marty Decatur had defeated Oscar Obert in a hard-fought three-game match. So the scene is now set. It's Jacobs against Decatur for the finals of the 1963 Wall Nationals. Jim looks relaxed, but he knows that in Marty Decatur, he's going to have a very formidable opponent, one who is very much at home on this three-wall court. Jim has told me many times that the only way he was able to beat Marty in this match was to keep him on the court as long as possible and to try to tire out the young, aggressive challenger. I wonder if either of these champions knew that two years later they would win their first national doubles title and begin a 12-year undefeated reign. It's incredible that during their reign they won five national double championships. They never lost a single match, either in practice or tournament play. That's a record that will probably never be matched. Let's go back to the action. With a terrific left corner kill, Decatur wins the first game. But the Jacob strategy is starting to pay off and the constant volleying would soon wear down the sharp shooting Decatur. Here in the beginning of the second game, Jim continues his battle plan by moving Marty around the court. 
You're right, Art. And while Jim does not look flashy, he is forcing Decatur to expend energy. It's getting Jim closer and closer to his bottom line objective, which was always winning the match. Now watch closely the championship form that Jim demonstrates to end this match. He executes a beautiful fly shot with a reverse hook for the title. The following year, 1961, Jacobs defends his title against all-time three-wall great Vic Herskowitz. Although giving away 10 years to Jacobs, the 41-year-old Vic offers a serious challenge to Jim's crown. That's true, Art. Remember, Herskowitz won the first nine three-wall national tournaments ever played and was always a great competitor, but particularly on these courts, which allow for the perfect blend of his one and four wall skills. With each player exhibiting his distinctive brand of handball, Jim's overall strategy, however, neutralized Vic's powerful serve and shoot game. Stuffy, we're probably looking at two of the finest all around handball players to ever walk on a court. You said it, Art. Jim had great respect and admiration for Vic. He would say, Vic was the first handball player to exhibit a free swinging left hand, and that Vic was the forerunner of the modern day ambidextrous handball player. And first from the 92nd Street YMHA in New York City, at Jim Jacobs. Jim, could I ask you to come over here for a minute? Jim, you've won so many, so many tournaments, but you haven't played, actually, in the singles for a couple of years, right? That's right, Jim. I haven't played for two years. Are you ready today? Well, I'm going to try very hard. Good. Good luck to you, Jim. Thanks very much. And now from uh, the New York Athletic Club in New York City, Oscar Olbert. Oscar, I ask you to come over here a minute. Oscar, you've had a tremendous amount of play this week in doubles and singles and everything. How do you feel about today's match against the great Jim Jacobs? Well, I time? feel pretty great. I'm not tired, and I think I physically fit to play a good game. We're looking forward to this, and good luck to you, too. Good, Oscar. And now let's play ball. It's 1964, and here at St. Louis in the finals of the USHA Four Wall Nationals, Jim Jacobs meets two-time defending champion Oscar Obert. It's important to note that for the past two years, Jim had been concentrating on winning four wall national doubles championships with Marty Decatur. This year, with Marty's marriage date taking precedence of the tournament, Jim decided to once again turn his attention to the singles field. An interesting set of priorities for a handball player, letting his marriage date interfere with the tournament. Hard to believe. In his semifinal match, Oscar had to go three tough games with the Arizona strong boy, Dave Graybill and Jim defeated an up-and-coming Hollywood, California player by the name of Stuffy Singer. Here in the finals, Jim won the first game 21-13. And we'll be watching the second game with both men pulling out all the stops. 18 playing 10. Jim Jacobs will serve, leading 18-10. Won the first game of the best two of three, 21-13. 
He wins it. It's over. Oscar wins it. We made the third and final game. Wait. 19.10. Jim Jacobs now 19 points. Two more to go for the championship. 21 is the game. No, down ball. If you listen, you can 10 hear. 10, plays 19. Oscar Oprah, sir, if you listen, you can hear the ball. If it comes off the floor, it has a different sound. The referee calls it. On sound, most of the time, it's so low and so hard, it'd be almost impossible to call it any other way. Plays 19. That was a pass shot by Oscar Obert. Oscar now serving. 10 points. Three for Oscar Obert. Sally, 12 plays 19. There's a referee say, good get. That, that was a good get. It was a tough return for Oscar Oden. Jim Jacobs had ceiling shot along the wall on the left side. It came off, though. Right out. 19 plays 12. That is Jim Jacobs' specialty, that ceiling shot. Jim Jacobs serving with 19 points. No, one short. He's two points away from the championship. Right out. 12 plays 19. Another great kill by Oscar Obert, now serving. Back wall shot and a kill by Jim Jacobs. 19, playing 12. You have two, one more. You already have two, you have one to go. Yes. All right. Let's play ball. Jim. 19 is playing 12 to Jacob serving. Jim Jacobs just asked how many towels he has left. He's allowed to get the towel three times, and that's all. He has used two. He's allowed no, one more time. That's a line ball. That's a short. Now, of course, to dry his face and so on and so forth. Allowed three times. Each player allowed three. He's used two. Point. 20. Game. Match point. That was a pass shot by Jim Jacobs. Now we're at match point. It's 20 for Jim Jacobs. One more point needs the chance. Two. One short. Eight. And he did win it. Jim Jacobs yeah. becomes the national champion, the All-American Championship singles. How about that, Stuffy? Jim, Jim comes back into the singles field after two years and defeats an awesome player like Oscar Obert. That was Jim, the complete athlete, the ultimate competitor. And now let's meet the champion uh, from uh, New York City, uh, Jim Jacobs. Jim, it uh, was an exciting and certainly a fast two games. It certainly was, Jim. I, uh... I'll tell you quite frankly, I never want to play this guy again. I had all I could uh, take today. He was uh, great. And uh, I'm convinced now that it's just a matter of time before this guy takes me. I think I'll bow out gracefully. <laughs> Good. Congratulations, Jim. Thank you. And both you and Oscar played an exciting and tremendous game. Thanks very much. Bow out gracefully, he did not. The following year in Austin, Texas, he returned to the singles once more. Played you once again in the semifinals. And here in the finals, Jim gives away 10 years to Dave Graybill. Art, that's one of the things that made Jim so remarkable. Even at 35 years of age, he decided not only to go back and win his national singles title, but the doubles title as well with Marty. Now we're talking about two matches a day against the best players in the world for seven consecutive days. 
Let's watch his mastery over Grable in this match. I remember this well. Jim won the first game, and here in the second, Dave took an early lead. But Jim's consistent play brought him back into the game, and now he's in complete control. The atmosphere was electric. The audience of 1,500 people, the largest crowd ever to watch a handball match, were on the edge of their seats, looking through three walls of glass. Another first. 1,500 people, total focus on a small 20 by 40 foot area. In the handball world, it was like being at the old Yankee Stadium during a World Series, or Madison Square Garden for a heavyweight bout. It was like two gladiators, only confined in a four-wall court. I'm quoting Jim when he would say, I love the concept of getting into the court, closing the door, and having one person against the other. It could be the truest physical and intellectual test there is. As we watch this match, Observe Jim's emotional control. It was truly another weapon in his arsenal of many, one that many handball players might underestimate. Jim would say, if you realize emotions are a part of you, then you can deal with them. And deal with them he did, over and over again. It's true, Art. Jim would tell me that when he was young, he was often nervous and had a tendency to overhit the ball. He said he learned to use mental gymnastics to control both his nerves and emotions. His power of total concentration was extremely evident whenever you watched him play or were fortunate enough to be in the court with him. Since we're sharing some of Jim's philosophy as we watch this match, Jim often taught in clinics to study your opponents carefully, find out any weaknesses in their game. Jim practiced what he taught. He approached every match with a specific plan that he followed relentlessly. One more thing Jim used to say, Art, was do not give away needless points. His concept was that the only time he was going to hit the front wall and then the floor next was when he was going for a rally ending shot. He consistently hit around his opponent with front sidewall drives and effective ceiling shots. Easy to say, but Jim Jacobs could and did play just that way. Watch his control on the screen. At the 1967 Nationals, Jacobs and Decatur are interviewed before the finals. Do you ever feel that he gets in your way? Well, there are times when we'll look at each other, especially when the uh, right-hand partner would stick his left hand in, but provided he hits a kill shot, or I hit a kill shot with the off, off hand, uh, where we don't get too mad, but otherwise we will give our little stares. After a kill shot, all is forgiven? Oh, yes. If a fella sticks in his left hand uh, and then makes the right shot, usually there's a big smile between us. But I will say this. Uh, we are unique in that, uh, to the best of my recollection, there has never been a cross word or a cross look between us in the five years I've known him. A beautiful relationship, Jim. Uh, even better than that. Yeah. I hate to look into this side of handball, but... As well, long as we have the two experts right here, probably the best in the world, everybody around here says. Is there anything that can be done in the way of dirty play in handball? <laughs> you answer that. He's the expert on dirty play. Well, there uh, are a lot of ball players who will uh, shade a ball or can cover a ball or whatever. But What's that mean, Marty? Well, uh, it's more or less cutting your view of the ball 
and give me, or else giving you a very uh, short entrance to the to the to the front court. Mm -hmm. So there are there are methods, and uh, d some devious, some legal, uh, that can be used. Marty, do you and Jim have problems with the officials on hinder and things like that? When somebody just screams you off, there's a picture of Jim hindering a guy right back at the wall here. We can't get it right uh, now. Generally, there isn't too much uh, too much difficulty in this area. You don't turn around and talk to the officials then, Jim, right? No, you don't. You shouldn't do that because if you get a bad call on handball, everybody gets bad calls. Sure. If you call the official on it, uh, it's pretty well that you'll alienate him. Uh, even if you're right and he's wrong, it's mm -hmm. best not to say anything because uh, to get him angry at you, you know, it's, <laughs> that's not good. Given a good wallop, how fast will that handball be traveling, Jim? Suppose you, you really racked one on a hard serve, hard low serve, how fast will that ball be going? I would say it goes about the same speed as a pitched baseball, which would be between uh, 85 to 95 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. About the same fast. speed. Oh, yes. Jim, did you ever get hit in the back of the head? I mean, after you've hit one, it goes back over your head and you're watching the front wall. Did uh, anybody ever, uh, oh, you know, certainly. tap that little oh, hard rubber yes. ball back here? Right. I've been hit many times in the ears and the eye and the mouth. Sure. Well, you're far from punchy. Either you or Marty. Well, you you never embrace the thought of being hit with the handball, though you can't let that thought enter your mind. It's like if you're uh, if you're in a showdown uh, in the old west and you're going to draw a gun. Uh, if you start thinking of what's going to happen if you're shot, you'll never get into the showdown. So, in a handball court, when you're playing against a viciously hard hitter, you don't permit yourself the luxury of thinking what's going to happen if he hits me in the head, because if you do, you'll never get in the court. This is the finals of the 1967 National Doubles Tournament in San Francisco, and there must be over a hundred national championships among the players on the court. Jim and Marty, who last played and won in 1965, did not compete in 1966, but here they faced the great Obert brothers of New York. In reaching the finals, the Oberts defeated the pick-a-partner team of myself and Dave Graybill, while in the other semis, Jim and Marty defeated Pat Kirby and Lou Cranberg and it was during this match that Jim seriously sprained his ankle. How Jim was able to play in the finals is a story that has been told and retold around the handball circles for years. But let me tell you Jim's own thoughts from a 1978 Handball Magazine interview. In that interview, Jim said, The evening before the finals, my ankle blew up like an elephant. The next morning, they took me to the hospital and the doctor said that even if he injected the foot, I would be immobile and wouldn't be able to play. He asked the doctor to come to the court before his two o'clock match and the ankle was injected. I'll quote him again when he said, we cut away the tennis shoe and taped my foot to the bottom and all the way up the ankle to look like a tennis shoe. My foot was dead from Novocaine and I was convinced we were gonna lose the match. This is the day Marty Decatur won the national doubles championship by himself. They lost the first game 21-12, but Marty told Jim, I can play better than that and we're gonna win this match. I was at this match and Marty just rolled out ball after ball and they battled back to win the second game 21-17. Marty told me that it was not that he needed motivation when playing against the Over Brothers, but that watching Jim playing with this serious injury and not yielding to the pressure and the pain drove him still further. Look at the incredible fly shooting ability of Marty, and a happy Jim seems to say, way to go, Marty. Jacobs and Decatur knew that the defensive skills of Carl Obert were not equal to his offensive abilities, so their strategy was to make certain that every serve went to the hard-hitting, offensive-minded left-hander. Jim and Marty would defend their title in 1968, 
and Marty would go on to win three more national doubles championships with Jim's protégés, Stuffy Singer and Steve Lott. But also in that year, Stuffy, your resounding championship win over Ray Nevue brought a special joy to Jim, your mentor. He was proud as you continued to win tournaments, but even greater was his satisfaction of his lifetime friendships with you, Steve, and Marty. As we watch Jim play with this horrendously bad ankle, let me quote Jim again about pain and fear. His theory was that nature puts these elements within you to help in time of stress. He felt you must let the way you feel work for you and do what must be done in order to win within the framework of the rules. He said that attitude is what separated the amateur from the professional. Jim's entire handball career, in fact his life, reflected that attitude, Stuffy, a true professional. In typical Oscar Obert style, watch him crunch this right corner kill. Not to be outdone, Marty returns the favor. An incredible trap kill by Decatur bring them one point closer to the title. And Decatur comes right back with an ace down the left. Again quoting Marty Decatur, he said, The feeling of confidence playing alongside Jim Jacobs was indescribable. He was able to bring your game up to an even higher level of play. Jacobs and Decatur win the third game 21-15 over the Great Obert brothers. Jim said this victory meant more to him, keeping the undefeated string intact, and was one of his greatest thrills in his handball career. Nineteen sixty seven also saw two of the greatest players of all time meet in coast to coast exhibition matches two-time defending national singles champion Paul Haber against the legend Jim Jacobs. First, the scene was the 92nd Street YMHA in New York, Jim's home court, where they split two exciting matches. And three months later, in a rubber match at the Los Angeles Athletic Club, the two men met and put on an unforgettable display of handball. Jim knew how tough Paul would be. He knew Paul's ceiling shots and defensive play were the best in the business.
Both men, like chess masters, move each other around the court until they get the open shot. And it's Jacobs who picks up a crotch. It is the same Los Angeles Athletic Club court where Jim won his first national singles title when he beat Vic Herskowitz a dozen years before. Watch this right-handed reverse kill off the back wall. You know, Stuffy, Jim had a very pragmatic view towards athletes and their greatness. He felt, and in any field, each generation of people uses the accumulated knowledge of their predecessors as a jumping off point for further development. He never thought that only one person was the best forever, and he always moved forward in his own life after handball. But great he was, Art, and his record backs up the statement. He won the United States Handball Association Singles Championships in 1955, 1956, 1957, and 1960, he also won the doubles with Dick Wiseman. He continued on in singles to win in 1964 and 1965. In doubles with Marty Decatur, title wins in 1962, 63, 65, 67, and 68, and Art, I haven't even touched on the countless other titles such as three wall tournaments, AAU titles, YMCA titles, world titles, and numerous prestigious invitational wins throughout the country. Couple tournament and invitational play with his teaching skills and exhibitions, not the least of which was when Jim arranged for Marty Decatur and I to join him in an exhibition tour for the United States Air Force bases in Germany, England, and France. The legend of handball, oh yes. Art, watch Jim at work. Here Paul overhits a ceiling attempt and that's all the Jim needs. Bang, right corner. Jim switches to serving down the right and Paul is unable to answer with a strong return. Although Paul is the two-time defending singles champion and considered by Jim the greatest defensive ball player of all time, Jim's control of the game is a wonder. He's playing like a master against the national champion. Jim is dominating Paul the way he dominated everybody. Just an incredible choice of shots, spectacular power, speed, and those ever-present hooks, the ones that just turned you inside out when he hit them and had you scared to death that he was gonna throw them even when he didn't. Jim was totally responsible for taking a scientific and methodical approach to the game. He brought the term percentage handball into play, and along with his incredible physical tools, he had the discipline to force you to do things that you just didn't want to do.
With Jim serving at game point, Paul will charge in for a ball hit down the left side and crash into the wall. An unfortunate way to end the game at 21-10. But Paul, being the great champion he was, did continue his career. And against all other players of his day, went on to win a total of five national singles championships. Decatur serving, and Jim Jacobs, the defending champions... In 1968 in St. Louis, Jim and Marty played their last national doubles tournament against Oscar and Ruby Obert here in the finals. It was also Jim's last national championship. Magic ...all week long, and made a great effort to win their first USHA four-wall championship. But the sparkling play of Marty Decatur in crucial moments throughout the match brought a fifth doubles title to the defending champions, 21-19, 21-9. Another championship to Decatur and Jacobs, and the finish to a tough week of handball for all four men. We hope you've enjoyed this momentary flash of light into the handball world of Jim Jacobs. Many great names and faces have been emblazoned on the screen. Few, however, with the impact on the sport and on the members of the handball fraternity as Jim Jacobs. His influence and legendary presence did not end with the close of his competitive career, nor has it ended with his untimely death in 1988 from leukemia. Jim gave to each of us a legacy of handball lore and served as a model and ambassador for the sport. It is appropriate and fitting that Jim, the man, the athlete, be remembered. On and off the court, in handball and in the boxing world, Jim conducted his success with skill, dedication, intelligence, and loyalty. He maintained an ever-present optimism and good cheer that characterized his life. Your contribution to the Jim Jacobs Leukemia Research Fund will help to preserve his memory and allow you to play an active role in winning the battle against this terrible disease, providing hope to many that a cure will be found in our lifetime. What better way is there to honor a champion, Jim Jacobs, the legend of handball? Jacobs from Los Angeles has won the go far in the game of handball.